Okay, it is January 5th, 2005. We're interviewing Claire Matthews this morning for the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum Oral History Project. Um, Claire, let's start with your background. When were you born and where? Um, I was born in Boulder, Colorado at the Boulder Community Hospital in 1933. Flag Day, <laughs> and I have uh, lived here ever since. Wow. Okay, and you say that your mother and father taught at the University of Colorado? Yes. Uh, my dad was an attorney, and he taught economics and uh, uh, political science at CU. And then my mother was a musician, and she taught in the music school uh, for several years, and actually until she was married. Where did you go to high school? I went to high school at Boulder High, which was the only high school in Boulder. <laughs> so uh, I graduated in 1951. And did you have any uh, higher education after that? Yes, I graduated from CU in 1955. In, and what was your major? Your Actually, my major was business, but commercial science, which they no longer have. That was typing. Uh, oh. Shorthand, <laughs> they, and now when they show it uh, listed, it's uh, computer science, and they didn't have computers back then, of course. But <laughs> okay. Now my dad uh, also, after he left the university, he was the assistant U.S. attorney in Denver, and he actually acquired the land for Rocky Flats, and as children, well, teenagers probably, he would drive us out to show us the place where Rocky Flats was going to be and of course I knew nothing that was going on and he probably didn't either. He just acquired the land. Do you remember what it was like out there when there was nothing there? There was nothing. Uh, it was called the church ranch property but you know I don't ever remember seeing a ranch house out there. It was probably just for grazing. I'm really not sure and you know we weren't all that interested in it at the time, but uh, my dad just wanted to, I, I don't know if he wanted to check on the land or just show us what he actually did at the office or what, but it... How old were you then? Uh, you know, I must have been a teenager because I can't imagine uh, Rocky Flats, I believe, actually opened out there in 53, maybe. So. so, you know, it probably was while I was still in uh, high school mm -hmm. or maybe junior mm -hmm. high. Mm -hmm. I do not remember the dates. And it was essentially just a long, flat plain of land. Just probably like it looks almost now. Hmm. Absolutely. And there were no um, businesses like there are now. Uh, the wind energy, uh, but the little windmill type things uh, wasn't there, or the cement plant. There was just nothing out there. It was in the country. And I'm sure it was a dirt road uh, at that time. Yeah. And so. it was Highway 93 still. That I don't there. think it was called Highway 93 then. I, I do not remember. Hmm. But, uh, and of course 128 didn't cut off from there then either. That's true. That's true. Um, have you ever been married? Do you have a family? I've been married twice. I uh, adopted, we adopted, my first husband and I adopted uh, three children who are now grown, and then uh, I divorced him in uh, 76, I believe, and I remarried in 79, and then my second husband died <clears throat> two years ago. Um, let's, go, let's go back to your dad acquiring the land for, for Rocky Flats. Um, did he, you said he didn't know why he was acquiring it? Was the city, did the city acquire the land? No, the, actual, the government, uh, since he was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, it had to come down from Washington uh -huh. that they were acquiring this land, and it must have belonged, well, it would have been in Jefferson County, and I have no idea uh, about anything, uh, the details. I just plain don't know. Right. When, when is your first memory, even before you thought of um, applying for a job out at Rocky Flats, when, when is your first memory of the plant coming 
to the area? I honestly can't even tell you how I decided to apply out there. I'm kind of thinking that at that time they used to have recruiters come to see you to interview students that were graduating and I wonder if maybe they were recruiting there. Huh. But I do not have any idea how that, uh, what I knew about it and of course it was such a well-kept secret. They worked out of, um, I think, weren't they in Lakewood or, or um, Arvada? Uh, the offices were until the plant was built. So that was probably in 53, but uh, Dow Chemical came out here in 51, I believe, to uh, actually start the plant. And then I started in 55, but I knew very little about it. But I do remember having an interview and them telling me that I couldn't start work until I got my clearance. And I applied in February and was going to graduate in June so uh, the clearance came through before uh, I was uh, available for work, so. So um, getting uh, back to the whole first, first impressions of Rocky Flats, or when, when you decided to apply for a job there, did you have any idea what kind of a job you were would be doing? None. I knew I had a degree in yeah. secretarial science and so they were looking for secretaries and this I knew nothing. Nothing. It was a, a good job. It paid, I believe I started either 200 a month or <laughs> two, sure. yes, and I think my husband was making uh, 250. He was um, an accountant. And uh, between the two of us, we were wealthy. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so your husband worked at Rocky Flats also? No. Uh, oh. My husband uh, uh, worked for, uh, what was it called then? Well, for Alan Lefferdink, who I'm sure you may have heard of in the archives. Um, and his brother was an officer there, so he had worked there. But my second husband uh, worked out there, and he was a construction manager there for 10 years and retired. And, 90 I believe it was but no I had no idea what I would be doing or who I'd be working for what Nothing. was do you remember what the interview process was like yeah. other than coming to campus um, not really the PSQs that we had to fill out uh, which of course they gave you to work on were very, very detailed. And I still have them because they have such good information. I had to track down people's birth dates and where I had worked before. And actually, this was my first full-time job. I had worked while I was in college at the book bindery and for a professor, but this was my first real job. So I, I do not, I remember the woman that interviewed me very well. She later became a wonderful friend. But uh, I remember she was very enthusiastic and very personable, and it was a good interview, but we also had to take skill tests, typing tests, shorthand tests, math tests, and I don't know if they still do this when you apply for jobs, maybe. <laughs> um, so they were recruiting women in 1953. Well, 55 is when I uh -huh. started. Uh, yes, there were women out there. Uh, but just as secretaries, I'm sure. I doubt it. I really don't know if they had any women scientists there. Of course, then it came to that. They had some very sharp women out there when I left. Also, the plant, when I started, had 1,200 people. And when I left in uh, 95, I think they had 8,000, so there was quite a leap in there. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about the clearances, the, the form that you said. What, what was the name of that form again? Uh, PSQ. It was a Personnel Security Questionnaire. Very lengthy. And then they did, uh, I imagine it was the FBI at that time that uh, checked you out. And then uh, I, 
they had later on red badges and blue badges, but I think the blue badges were the people that were cleared, the red were the people that were going through clearance. But I think at that time you actually had to have your blue badge be cleared completely before you could Does go to work. Does that mean Q clearance? Yes, yes. Okay. And I don't think we had top security. I think Q was the only clearance we had out there. I don't think they had the top security and secret and clearances like that. I never heard about them if they did. So Q was the, was the yeah, top yeah. level? Yeah, which uh, meant you could get into all the buildings. Of course, you had to clear through the desk and the guards if you went into a different building than your own. Well, you had to show it even when you went into your own building when I first started. Um, <clears throat> yeah, let's go, let's go back to when you first started. You, it sounds like you first learned about Rocky Flats when you were graduating from college. Right. I was looking for a, a job, right. <laughs> period. And, and so you started work in, in 1955, and you find yourself in a place where you have to show badges and go through several guard stations. And what was that like? What was it like? I knew nothing different, but it, it seemed, well, it was very regimented. After you showed your badge at the guard post, and they actually came to the car, picked up your badge, looked at it, handed it back to you. Um, we went up to Building 111, which was the administration building, and I'm sure that only the people working in that building had to go through this particular process, but we walked in and there was a long room with lots of little slots, and you took your time card out of the slot, checked in, and I can't remember if it was an automatic check-in where you clicked it for the time or if you wrote the time, but you checked in and then at night when you left, you checked out the same way. You had to uh, put your time card back in there. And that doesn't sound too much different than plant work in general well, no. at that time, but what, what is, is really interesting is the procedure of getting the blue pass or the red pass. Um, so you fill out the questionnaire, and how long did you have to wait? Well, from February to June, February, which isn't all that long. Sometimes now they go for two years. But um, I, and I wasn't able to go to work until July. I was getting married on July 9th, and the day I got back from my honeymoon, I went to work. I was very dedicated. <laughs> But it, I had the clearance then. It, it worked out extremely well as far as my timeline. Yeah. And okay, so you get you get to the plant, and what what were the first things you did? Um, they had at that time a typing pool, and it was uh, well, there was a railing around it with a I don't think it was a lock gate, but a gate there, and the uh, managers would bring managers or whoever would bring typing to this pool and we sat in this there were several of us in the pool we hadn't been assigned real jobs yet so we typed and that was about it I don't believe I even took uh, shorthand while I was in the pool maybe occasionally we did but there were several of us and then I wasn't in the pool very long before I went to work for the uh, I think it was called the recreation department <laughs> And uh, my job there was to count money out of the uh, vending machines, keep the bowling scores. We had several, we had two big bowling leagues. It was big business. And then I also put the uh, uh, little pins in the carpool map. We had different colored pins for different areas. And carpools were a very big thing at that time. Uh, most people did carpool. Let me, let me back you up just mm -hmm. for a couple seconds. Um, when you first started in the typing pool, were you in bu Building 111? I was in Building 111, yes. Okay. And you were talking, it was just a big open It space? was an open area, right. Okay. And uh, there must have been 10 of us in there. Okay. And then the women's employment uh, manager also was in this area. She had a, a private desk at least, but she was there with us and assigned the work and made sure it got done. And did you have to 
put your work away at the end of the day? Did you have to have your desk completely clear? Do you remember? I don't remember, but I think that's probably true and maybe even locked up. Uh, but what we did, or what I did anyway, was not in any way confidential, except from the standpoint that it might have had uh, salaries or something on it. But I had no idea what they did out there. And it didn't matter, you know, it was a job. Right. It really, yeah. But, and so you moved on then to the recreation yes. department. Now, which building was that, that in? That was still in Building 111. And, and was the bowling alley on the premises? No, no. We bow and I can't remember. I think they had a bowling league in Boulder and one in Arvada. Uh, but there were a lot of people involved in that, and it was very competitive, and they had bowling banquets at the end of the year. And it, it was sponsored. I, I think we paid our own bowling fees, but it was sponsored, you know, by Rocky Flats. And we actually had a former coach that was uh, in charge of this department, a big, heavy set man. I'm surprised he could even walk, but he was over all the. And I, I think they probably had other teams too. I was just involved with the baseball. But they had a lot of vending machines out there at that time, you know, candy and pop. And they did have a cafeteria, which was in 112, I believe. And uh, we had a chef. <laughs> and the f I don't know how many other places there were to eat out there because I didn't go at that time. Later on, they had several cafeterias throughout the plant. But we didn't always have a chef. <laughs> so the food was pretty good. It was. It wasn't bad. And... Uh, Actually, this chef for special occasions uh, made very fancy, huge cakes, and everybody could come up and have a piece of the cake. And he, he wore a white hat, a big white chef's hat, and uh, had special feeds for not, maybe not the whole plant, but like for all the managers uh, if something, uh, some big accomplishment had been made. Now, our biggest theme back then was safety. And we had uh, uh, daily, I think, a uh, sign that told how many days they had gone without a lost time accident. And we had teams, and when your team reached a certain goal, uh, the manager, well, the Dow Chemical, I guess, uh, provided a very nice party at the Aviation Club in Denver. And I don't even know if that's still there, but it was a very, very nice country club type place. When you talk about safety goals, can you recall what those, what some of them might have been? Um, I think the main point was that no one get hurt. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, just do everything safely. And actually, to my knowledge, there has only been one actual death due to an accident at the plant. There have been a lot of injuries and of course the radiation. But uh, this was a, an electrician that had pulled the wrong switch. Uh, and he was the only death and that would have been, well, probably 85. So that's kind of a, uh, an amazing thing for a plant that was as dangerous as this was. Which brings us to the question, when did you discover what you, what Rocky Flats was all about? I was only there five years the first time, and then we adopted a baby, and this was the dark ages. Uh, you couldn't work if you adopted a baby. So I quit. Well, I had told my boss for two years I was leaving, but then I quit with about a day's notice, which upset him badly, but, but he had his, he was warned. And so I didn't really know until I came back uh, in 75. Five, I think so I was gone from 60 to 75 I had that gap and then when I came back it was more obvious because there had been then a little bit of information in the papers they still didn't really tell you what you were doing but when I came back I worked as a uh, part-timer for a while so I went into all the well not all the buildings but a lot of buildings out there and I worked in one that had uh, the glove boxes in a room next to where I was seated. We wore lab coats. Do and you remember what building that was? That was uh, 771. 
That, that was the... Yeah, the big one. And uh, uh, we had to carry our masks uh, around our neck. And they had drills occasionally. I was never involved in a real evacuation. But uh, they were very conscious that something could happen. What, what were you doing in 771? I was actually acting as a secretary again. I had very, very little to do, and my boss said I could read as long as I, no one caught me. He, was, he realized, you know, there was really nothing to do, and I was a part-timer, but they had to have someone there to answer phones. But I never did anything very uh, dramatic. There were occasional words and reports that I didn't exactly understand, and uh, I, I really wasn't too conscious, I guess, of what was going on. And I was never really concerned about uh, radiation or, uh, you know, being hurt in any way. So you worked from 55 to 60 mm -hmm. at full time right. as, as a secretary and then you took 15 years off and you came back. What was the, um, the requirement, the, the job application requirements when you came back? Actually, I think I was rehired because I had kept in touch with the people out there. I didn't really have to do anything differently, and I went back into the, well, after I was in recreation, uh, the woman that was uh, the secretary to the personnel director left giving a day's notice, and they needed someone desperately. And because I had a college degree, I think is why they, uh, they didn't even interview, I don't think, they just asked me if I would take the job. And so she briefed me for maybe two hours before she left, and it was kind of scary to go into a job like uh, that, but uh, I, I handled basically personnel things. I handled this, they had little uh, index cards with everyone's salary and kept them in a drawer, if you can imagine, and if somebody got a raise, I'd go write it down there. And I also had all the uh, personnel, P well, the PSQs and the personnel files in, in my office, and of course that was locked, and nobody could see those. And what else did I do in that office? Uh, the uh, director of uh, personnel was a, a very strange man. I actually think now that he may have been a drinker. He was gone a lot, and he just wasn't. Uh, he, I, I didn't care for him that much. But you know, he was easy enough to work for. And actually, the dress code at that time is quite interesting. Women had to wear their skirts below their knees hose and heels, and the uh, manager, the women's employment manager, she and I were exempted from wearing hose during the summer because we tan so well. Is that discriminatory? <laughs> Isn't that weird? But uh, she was a very, very nice lady. She really was. And we also were allowed to wear um, slacks on days that it was snowing or windy and the winds out there were terrible, terrible, terrible. And also uh, the snow could, they, it used to snow more here, I think. And they would line up trucks for people to get out to the uh, parking lot. We'd hang on to each other and walk out, you know, in a line when it was time to go home. Now was that in the wind or in the snow? Either. The wind was probably worse than the snow. But we were allowed to dress down for those. Also. Um, at that time, they didn't give maternity leave, so when a girl would get pregnant, she would wear full skirts as long as she could, because as soon as she showed, she lost her job. And it wasn't necessarily there, you know, when she came back, which is really sad, but we had a lot of sick little girls there, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and the men all dressed very, very nicely. Suits and ties and uh, just, you know, it was a professional atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, let's let's go back to when you came. So that was 1955 to 1960, and then when you came back in 75, you 
didn't really have to reapply for a job, is that correct? Well, I'm sure I had to fill out another application um, and also renew my PSQ. I, I just had to update it, well, for what, the last 15 years. Uh, but it, it seemed like, I remember I had, been, oh, in between this, I had been working for the construction company out there. I forgot to tell you. So I came back, um, that would have probably been 72. I went to work for the construction company and worked for the same man that had uh, been in charge of the bowling. <laughs> so he, he knew me and I only worked part time so I could come in after my kids went to school and be home when they got off. And when the construction company then was booted out, they changed after being there since 1951. This was Swinnerton and Wahlberg. And uh, in about 70, I think it was 75, uh, a new construction company came in and they were laying people off and I didn't really have a job that I liked. So I called to see if I could get back on as a part-timer with uh, uh, Rocky Flats, I mean with with Dow Chemical or I, when did Rockwell come? Maybe it was 75 when Rockwell started. It may have been Rockwell, sure. but uh, the head of women's employment actually had replaced me when I left in 60. So I had been friends with her for all this time and had seen her regularly and she uh, put me on. Now you just said head of women's employment. Were there different people in charge of women and men employment? Oh yes. Uh, <laughs> she just handled the women. We did have a woman that handled all the uh, hourly men, the machinists and so forth, but she just handled men. Well, there were no women machinists then. Yeah, it was very regimented. Also, when I came back in, uh, oh, I worked part-time just maybe a year and a half, and she called and asked if I would like to come back full-time. And I was in the process of getting a divorce and knew I was going to have to work. So I went back to basically the same job I'd had before in personnel, which has changed names, human resources, whatever down the line, and actually found in the files letters that I had typed in 1960. And they hadn't changed the forms at all. I mean, you just had to, isn't that strange after all those years? But um, at that time, we had an affirmative action uh, plan, I guess it would be. You had to document uh, how many people, you had, how many minorities you had hired. And when someone came, to, they had a window, and people would walk up to this window to apply for a job. And as soon as they came in, you put a little notation in the corner to indicate whether they were white or black or Hispanic. And I'm sure some of them must have caught on to what we were doing, but they were very strict about uh, minorities. And we had a, a Hispanic man that was in charge of the affirmative action office, and he kept on our backs. And uh, it was, well, it was how the nation was going at the time. Were women considered minorities? No, not then. Not, uh, I'm sure they must have been earlier, but um, as a matter of fact, I don't think they even notated that. And back then, women had women's names. <laughs> now you wouldn't know. <laughs> Sydney. <That's laughs> <true. laughs> so when you came back in 75, was that when you discovered what was actually going on at the plant? I still was only working with personnel things. But yes, I did know that they were uh, working with plutonium. And uh, I didn't really get a handle on it, though. We were hiring, uh, because I was in the department where they were hiring people, of course, we had people coming in applying for these different jobs. And although I didn't interview them, per se, uh, we did contact the managers to come up and meet with these people. And so I knew that there that these people were working in cl more classified areas because I wasn't in a classified area. But I, I, maybe I just didn't care or didn't realize or was so overwhelmed. <laughs> but it didn't ever really dawn on me until 
I stayed in that job until 80, I believe it was. I had a couple other minor jobs. Then I went to the medical department. And when I went over there, I was very aware because Which building was the that was in, now just a minute, 121, I think. Now that's, isn't that terrible? There was 121, 123, I think it was 121. And it was directly across the street from the administration building and also the cafeteria. So it was right still in that clustered area. But we gave employees a physical exam every year. It was required. They got chest x-rays, blood tests, and a general physical. And uh, at that time, we were also in the same building with the uh, body counter and they would take people in there. I think maybe it was once a year for most people and for people actually working with uh, plutonium, it was uh, oftener, and they would check to see if they had any uh, exposure. And if they had uh, too much, they took them out of the area they were working in. And that's when I first realized that there was something different going on out there. Did that happen? Uh, Fairly often, not often, rarely, that someone would have to be changed? Uh, I think, I can't honestly tell you how often. They would bring people in sometimes to decontaminate them. And uh, I wasn't there when this happened, but <clears throat> they had a fire out there in 59, I believe it was. And uh, <clears throat> several of those people had to stay in the medical department like overnight, maybe for several days, so they could get them back to and I don't know, they scrubbed them and they did, gave them medications and it was a big deal. Now, later on, I was with the medical department from uh, <clears throat> 80 until 90. Then I left to go into training for a year and there wasn't that much to do there. So I went into budgeting, which was awful. They were studying a new budgeting system and it was very, very difficult. And I worked in that for a year and then went to work in health effects, which was a brand new department. What year was that? This would have been 92. And uh, this was uh, the manager of the health effects department uh, <clears throat> had a program where we were uh, testing people actually for borreliosis. And it, before that, we had had a retiree recall program it was called where we would call back people who had been exposed uh, that had a, we, a known exposure and we would cart them out here from wherever they lived some of them were old and sick and whatever and we would fly them to Denver have a bus meet them there and take them to a hotel overnight bring them out to the uh, plant the next day for their physicals and then send them back and I actually was in charge of the scheduling of these people getting them out here. And that's when I was working in the medical department. Then when I went to the health effects department, we started bringing back anybody that had worked at Rocky Flats that wanted to be tested. And there were a lot of people. So uh, I don't know who came up with the idea. I, I have a funny feeling uh, that I had something to do with it because bringing all these people in was such a chore, we decided to go to the sites like uh, we went to uh, Los Angeles, we went to uh, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, I could, New Mexico, and we would have people that lived in that area come closer to home. Some of them could drive, others we flew in, and that meant that uh, several of us would go to whatever city it was, and these people were sent questionnaires in advance that were as long as the PSQs. They would bring their paperwork in, they would do a blood test that consisted of eight tubes of uh, blood and we sent them to two different labs so we would get accurate uh, so testing. When you, when you went out into the field to do this testing, mm -hmm. did you have a, a van or did you, I mean, where, where did the testing take place? It, it took place in a medical facility and we did not take nurses with us. We always had to have it in a medical facility. The nurses would draw the blood and do the x-rays and after a while we started taking a doctor with us to read the x-rays there so we didn't have to send them away and it worked out 
well, I loved to travel, of course, and we always stayed in very nice hotels, and the people I worked with were personable. We'd go two or three days at a time, but we could click off 40 people in two days this way instead of having 40 different people. And it was a cost savings also. Our uh, travel expenses saved, uh, I mean, uh, were not nearly as bad as having to bring 40 or 50 people in. And that was a very interesting job. But what is amazing, I think when I left, and I could be really wrong on these figures, that there were only 20 people that had actually been diagnosed with borreliosis. And of course, um, the, you know, these people were supposed to get, what, $1,500, or, which isn't very much. But some of them were really, really sick. And others, well, they could have had lung problems from something else in addition. But it was really sad, and most of them old people, and I was a great asset because I knew them all. <laughs> I'd been there so long. And of course, most of these other people were new and had no idea who these people were. But it was a very interesting job. So, When you were working in health effects, was that in the same building as the medical? It was. It was. We shared uh, offices and... Can you remember how that building was laid out? The medical building was, well, it was very cramped. It was not, well, the place expanded so much. But they had an x-ray room. They had a very good filing system. Everybody out there had their a personnel or a medical file with their uh, picture taken when the first day they came to work and some of the pictures were so funny because they'd been there 30 years and they changed a little. Um, so we had a receptionist that handled that. We had several nurses and at one time I think three doctors. Um, and it was uh, right next to the body count so if they came in for their physical they I think they often went directly to the body count while they were there for their physical. And the body count, have you seen, well, no, Tell you've seen about. nothing. Uh, they looked like dentist chairs. And they had you uh, lean back in this chair and then they put, uh, I, don't, I don't think they put electrodes on you, but they had some sort of a, uh, you know, one of those, not x-ray machine, but something that. Uh, like a scanner? Uh, yeah, yeah. And you had to. Well, they played music and you could sleep if you wanted to. And I think it was about a half an hour you sat in this chair. And they would determine if you had, you know, an excess of plutonium. But until you did the x-rays and everything, you, I guess, didn't get the whole picture. Was it a Geiger counter that they used? I think it may have been. Okay. It may have been. And I wasn't that, you know, I wasn't interested in actually how uh, things were done, which is now thinking back, I should have shown a little more <laughs> interest, but it wasn't really. Uh, and so the the building 121 housed the the medical. Was it like a clinic almost? It it was. I would say it was like a clinic, but it had a lot of offices, very small offices, and they did build on at one point when health effects came over the. Uh, they had to add on to it, but it was uh, it was never really big enough. My first job when I went over there, I sat in a reception area at a desk facing all these guys sitting there without shirts waiting to go in for their x-rays. It was kind of weird, you know, kind of <laughs> tantalizing situation. <laughs> um. And then, and then the body count place where you went to see if you were uh -huh. conta or contaminated in any way, was that in a separate building? No, it was in the same building that we were in and basically just down the hall. And it was a, also very small. I think they had three small rooms in there so they could do two or three body counts at a time. But it was, you know, not a big facility at all. So what did you do at Health Effects? Basically, I handled uh, the transportation and the um, lodging for people that had to stay in a hotel. And I packed up all the supplies to go on these trips. We had uh, to take, uh, let me think, 
tons of these special tubes with us because they had something in them that tested just for uh, whatever we were testing for. <laughs> but they had a certain uh, chemical in there. And what else? Did we, well, we had taken an awful lot of paperwork. And I was thinking that when I was working with just the people that were coming out for their physicals, we had to send them these uh, urine packs, four bottle, four empty bottles. We'd send them their urine packs before they came in so that they could either send them back or bring them with them. And I got to <laughs> process all of those and take them over to the building across the street, which was called, I don't know, but uh, they did all the testing in a building across the street. So we'd take all our urine bottles over there and they'd test the urine and see if there was anything in there. But I don't think we gave urine bottles to the people that came in for the, that we went on site to. I think they just had blood tests and x-rays. So there so, was testing on site though. There was a lab that you could test things. Yes, yes. And I think they sent the blood out, but the urine they did test there. And sometimes they'd be uh, weeks behind on that testing. Then we'd send everyone a notice of what the tests were. Generally, what were the results of these tests? I mean, people would go through every year and they would get all these tests. Do you have any memories of people just generally being healthy, generally having problems? Um, I think that there were probably mostly healthy people. I don't think they came up with too many really uh, gross problems. Occasionally they did. And of course the people that we were really interested in bringing back were the ones that were involved in that fire. And we had two very, very sick people that uh, I'm surprised they're still alive. I keep seeing one in the grocery store and he looks better than I do, but I'm sure we've taken very good care of him. But uh, it, the, that fire was really devastating. And I don't know how many people were actually, you know, damaged. Again, I wasn't there and you know, it was just, words, but I guess it was perfectly awful, so. You know, you, you are a Colorado native and a Boulder native and lived in Boulder before the plant was built and since the plant's been built. What kind of an impact did building of the plant have on Boulder County, do you think? I think that actually, at first, it was a money type thing, a lot provided jobs. I, I can't even tell you how many people actually had some connection out there, worked there for a short time or for a long time. And I think from that standpoint, from, for the economy, it was absolutely wonderful. Um, also, the salaries were always good. Of course, they had a union, so you know, they got good salaries. And at one time, uh, everyone, not just the union, but everyone got the week after Christmas off with pay, which seems a little extravagant, doesn't it? Yeah. The whole week. And I'd rather have it the week before, but I took it. <laughs> it just, uh, but everything out there, I, I had no complaints. The benefits were amazing and still are my retirement benefits. I don't pay for any prescriptions. I uh, don't have to pay for my medical at all. No copay. It's just really, uh, it was a good deal. And I'm glad I left when I did because I left before they tightened up on some of this. So in total, you worked at Rocky Flats for how many years, do you think? Well, let's see. I was there 20 years the second time in five, so 25. I tell people on and off for 40 years, that's all my life. <laughs> wow, wow, basically yeah. all your work life. E exactly, exactly. Um, you mentioned the fire. There, was, there were two fires. There was one in 1957 and there was one in 1969. I think it was the 69 that was the bigger one, but I, I honestly can't tell you. I don't know what the one, where was the one in 50? Seven or do you know? I don't know. I don't know either, and I, I should read up on, but. But um, it sounds like you were there in 1989 for the FBI raid. I was directly involved in that. <laughs> Why don't you tell us all about that? Um, 
they came to the medical department on a Saturday to go through all the medical records. And I was the only one available. It seems the uh, medical director had something to do and the head nurse just, so they asked if I'd go out there and I said, well, yes, but I have a permanent at one o'clock. <laughs> so I told these guys I had to leave, but I'd be back afterwards. But they went through all uh, my, uh, the medical director's desk, copied everything. And then they kept, I think they kept the originals and gave him the copies and eventually they sent the originals back. And I don't think they could have possibly looked through all the medical files, but they did a very thorough job. They were very nice. I mean, they if were you just... Were gonna, just to clarify, if you were going to say how the volume of those medical files, if every single person in the, at the plant must have been enormous numbers. Oh, uh, and I don't know. I can't remember now. I actually was in charge of the medical records. I don't know if they retired the files when people left and sent them to the archives or exactly what they did. We had uh, a facility down at the Federal Center in Denver where we kept older records, so I, I bet that they did send the... But at one time we had 8,000 employees and everybody had a medical record. And some of them were extremely thick because they'd been there so long. So, so why did they want to see the medical records? I really don't know except to see if there were exposures that hadn't come to light or, or something like that. I don't really know what the raid was all about. Wasn't at that time when smoke was coming out of a building and they thought it uh, was contaminated smoke and that's why um, someone had come over in an airplane and I don't even remember, but the FBI then felt they had to come and check something out. I don't know. So were you there all that day? Yes, but just the one day. And evidently they found what they needed, but they took um, the personal, uh, I won't say a diary, but the uh, medical director's, where he kept all these daily notes, but he wrote illegibly. So good luck to them. I don't know. I couldn't read his writing. I don't know how they managed. It wouldn't have really been very valuable to them, I don't think. But it, and maybe it was just an exercise. It's what they were paid to do. But they were <clears throat> very nice, and I don't even remember how long they were there. I don't think too long. Maybe a week or two. I remember the day they came because uh, in I was in building 111 for some reason and they had to go through there and all these guys in suits and <laughs> because at that time our dress code was a lot more lax than it had been in the early days. Um, we've talked a little bit about what it was like for women to work at the plant um, with respect to the dress code and hiring and, and that but what what kind of Issues did do you did you see the plant encounter, especially working in personnel, when women started working at the plant in large numbers? Actually, they still were mostly clerical, and uh, I I don't think I don't think there were any real problems. I think they were treated fairly, and of course there were people who claimed they weren't, and it it was. Uh, we had, sometimes when women were on uh, medical, not medical leave, but they could work restricted, they would put them in different uh, areas to keep them out of the uh, uh, restricted zones. But I, I don't, I did not see any discrimination. I, I felt that as far as that went, it was fairly clean, but again, I uh, wasn't everywhere, <laughs> but it, it just seemed that I don't think there were that many that were dissatisfied. They did really nice things for women on Secretary's Day. <laughs> like, such as? They had uh, a whole day where they would have seminars. Uh, some of them were entertaining, some of them were educational, and a big luncheon. And uh, then on Secretary's Day, we always got a plant from the boss, I mean, those typical things. But I, I never really um, 
felt that there was any real discrimination against women or against minorities. I was going to ask you yeah. that question next. Because we had a couple of uh, black women out there that, uh, well, one of them, uh, just for starters, had lied about her age on her PSQ, we found out later. But she had been a uh, reporter somewhere. And so maybe she was out there to create a stir. And then there was another one that was certifiably crazy. But she was there a long time and gummed up all kinds of things. But it wasn't really her fault. <laughs> <laughs> Should have kept a closer eye on her, but but other than that, I I didn't really see any uh, any problems with race, creed, color, sex, anything. And again, I may just not pay attention. So, <laughs> um, switching gears here for a little bit, we're going to talk about what was happening outside the plant. Um, in the 1970s, there were a lot of protesters, and you were there. How did you feel about the protests? Um, I really, I've never been an activist. I, I couldn't see what good they were really doing. And this, I believe, was on weekends. I don't think they ever uh, protested. I never saw any protesters. And I think they were trying to stop the trains and uh, have the plant closed down. And of course, we still sort of have that Rocky Mountain, whatever it is, activists. But um, I, I never could get really into their heads. I, I had no idea really what the point was. And I, I personally feel that what we were doing was needed at the time. And I think they're closing down for a good reason. I hope they won't need something like that again. But at the time, it seemed like the thing to do. And when you say the time, was it the 50s? The, the 50s, right, right, when uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, one of our um, managers out there had worked at Los Alamos uh, with the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. And uh, he actually, they thought he might have died of borreliosis when he, uh, he died, oh, maybe 15 years ago. Um, from some sort of a lung. I, they, I don't think they actually diagnosed it as that, but it could have been because he did work in the areas out here and probably in Los Alamos too. I, um, so you never had any direct contact with, with the protesters? No, no, none. Read about them in the paper, yeah. And of course, you heard stories of guards. For a while they had, uh, a very short while, they had dogs out there, uh, guard dogs. And uh, I remember uh, one of our nurse, night nurses always uh, let them bring their dogs in there and she'd feed them treats at night. <laughs> but they didn't keep them very long, so I don't know if they decided they didn't need them or if they were more nuisance than they were worth. But that was after the protesters, so that would have been in the uh, uh, probably late 80s or 90s. So. Um. Regarding the protesters again, there were a couple of issues that seemed to be paramount in, in the protests. One of them was just the fact that nuclear triggers were being made at right. the plant. And the other was safety factors. Did either one of those things ever give you pause about working at the plant? Never. Never. And I did work in I worked in building 779, which also had uh, uh, who knows what there. there were, uh, and I had to go from one part of the building to the other through some, uh, what are those, the double doors. And as I start to go in one, I put on my mask and would walk in the other side to pick up time cards and things and come back. And when I got out again, I could take off my mask. and that. I, and I did it because they said I had to. I wasn't really that frightened, but uh, it, it just, uh, and this safety, well, they s still, to this day, stress safety to the limits. And we had to have, we were required to take uh, classes every year on safety. And uh, then they came up with these computer 
classes that everybody had to take every year and answer all these questions about rims and ions. and It was like a science course. But regardless of what job you were in, you had to take those. Rams. Or, uh, what are a, those? Well, now that may not be the word, but you know, uh, pieces of, I mean, how, how many uh, exposure. Okay. Rim, I, I'm not sure that's the right word. That's <laughs> so that was part of the safety program that yes. everybody took these classes. Yes, they took uh, the classes. And when I was working uh, in training, we had these construction workers. Some of them couldn't even speak English. And we had to walk them through these uh, tests and actually almost give them the answer because they couldn't read English, they could understand English, but they didn't really know what you're talking about. But they had to pass the tests in order to work in certain areas. And that was, uh, you know, a little different. <laughs> well, um, Let's continue to talk about safety a little bit. You know, the public has a sense that Rocky Flats was a very dangerous place. Exactly, exactly. And that uh, the emissions would come into town. Now, I'll tell you something else. In 1978, I believe it was, my second husband was uh, in construction and he uh, had designed a house uh, that we were going to build in Louisville. He uh, bid on a lot over there that was 20 feet wide and 150 feet deep, so he had to design a special house. Well, when we went to apply uh, to build a house there, at that time we were just safe from the distance. You couldn't build a house within a certain distance of Rocky Flats. You know where uh, Superior is now? You couldn't build there because it was too close to the plant. Now look at the building. Isn't that something that's going up there? But we were in Louisville and just barely made the cut to build in this particular location. And now it's just so different, but people really were frightened. And you couldn't get uh, insurance on, if you did build a house there, you couldn't get insurance on it. And it was uh, just a different period. Let me have you hold that thought because I'm going to change the tape here oh. um, and we're going to start on a new tape. So hang on. Our conversation with Claire Matthews on January 5th, 2005. We were talking about um, public perceptions of Rocky Flats and you were discussing the fact that um, your second husband and you were building a house in Louisville and that the, the area around the plant was really considered by at least the insurance companies not places that they wanted to insure and that how much that has changed. So I'm going to ask you about your perception about the, safe, of the safety of working at Rocky Flats. Do you think it has changed over time? I think this, that they have drilled safety. Yes, I think it, prob they, it probably has changed. They have drilled safety into absolutely every facet of the work they do out there. And it, well, I think the fact that they've only had one actual death out there is impressive. But I, I really think that everyone is uh, aware that there is a, an issue. Now, my daughter is in the decon uh, phase of this, which is terribly, terribly dangerous. And uh, she realizes this, and, but it has to be done. But they take great safety precautions and the clothing these people wear, and they only let them stay in there so long. And I think that they really emphasize that because the, of course, whoever's in charge, I guess Kaiser Hill still. I guess there's so many different uh, people in charge out there now, but they can't take, uh, you know, lawsuits and too many bad <laughs> hits on that. But I really think, I've always felt it was safe, but I think it is it drilled in them even more now. Um, speaking of Kaiser Hill and all of the different contractors that have, um, manage the plant. 
you you work for Dow and you work for Rockwell. Rockwell, and I think E G and G was there a short time while I was there. So, do you have a sense of the different ways that these contractors managed the plant? Actually, no. I think the that probably the managers under Dow were more sincere and maybe uh, better managers. I don't really know. that We've had some, some managers that really didn't seem to be, to know what they were doing. Um, but also, you know, DOE was a big factor out there because they had their own offices and we had to go by their rules. And actually, when I was in health effects, we had a $2 million contract to handle these uh, tests on people, and I uh, had to keep track of the expenses for that and send them a report every month, I think it was. And they, you know, they uh, kept a pretty close eye on us, and I'm sure they did on all uh, the work out there. When you first started, I don't think there was a DOE, was there? No, it was an AEC, Atomic Energy Commission. And then it went to something else after that, I believe. And did. Did the AEC also have a presence on the plant? They did. They were in this in Building 111, where I was, and they, uh, I don't actually know what they did, but they were there, and they, you know, made their presence known. And they were all very nice people. They were just like you and me, but <laughs> they were there. Um, now, one of the things that, that you have talked about is what how you went out and tried to gather all of the people that had been exposed and take care of them. Um, do you think those with, with health effects from their work have been taken care of well? Uh, not necessarily. I think the bad thing was they were all promised money, but first you have to prove that you have it, and then they've had to wait. I think out of the 20 or so people, only two have received it's a very low amount. Two or three have actually received any money. And of course, they're all older now and probably won't live. And it isn't that much money. But I, th I think it's 1500 which doesn't sound like a lot of compensation. Maybe it's more, maybe it's more um, than that. So the compensation wasn't really what it, what it should have been in your opinion? No. And I, uh, now, I believe that Health effects is still in effect, but is under Oak Ridge now and not really involved with, uh, well, it's involved with Rocky Flats, but it's not funded by Rocky Flats. But um, I, I don't really, I don't think really they were. And a lot of uh, these people, like doing 40 people uh, at a time, most of them really had no, no evidence of anything, which of course was probably a relief to them too. And it, this was optional. They could come if they wanted to, but you know it wasn't required. But it just—I uh, don't—I don't think so. And of course, I don't think anyone knew when this first started that they were in danger. So right. just uh, right. Um, how do you feel right now uh, about the the well? A couple of questions. How do you feel about the fact that production has stopped at the plant? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I'm hoping it's a good thing. Uh, maybe their time has come to, uh, you know, not make things like that anymore. And really, as far as Rocky Flats is concerned, theirs was such a small part of the big picture. You know, it's like making the lens for the camera. But at the time, I think it was worse. Well, I'm, I am fine with them closing. I think it's probably about time. I don't know what they're going to do with the land. I can't imagine uh, them coming up with a decision right away, the environmentalists and the uh, activists. But uh, no, I, I have no problem with them closing. How about the cleanup? Do you think uh, that's being adequately done? Um. I hope so. It seems like they're going to a lot of effort to cover up uh, the holes in the ground, and I, I 
sincerely hope it's being done right. And I don't talk to my daughter too much about it. She has a real uh, idea of what's going on. But uh, it, it's just, uh, to me, they go to an awful lot of effort to make it right. But it's all unknown. I mean, they go into these buildings, they don't know what's there and what isn't. And it's very, it is scary. But I think they're going to, taking all the safety measures and let's hope so. Um, I think a couple, one of the plans that may have already been approved is for the wildlife mm -hmm. refuge. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a good site for that? Well, there's certainly a lot of wildlife out there. <laughs> It, it, in the, is it spring when the deer have their babies? Oh my gosh, it, it was actually fun to drive in on the road and see all those little uh, fawns. Of course, a lot of them got hit. And, but, and rabbits, and they had feral cats out there. And of course, the beautiful Preble mouse. That <laughs> I think they've only seen one, but it, uh, I, think, I think the wildlife would be all right. They say that it takes an awful lot of uh, plutonium or whatever to really damage a cute little creature, but uh, uh, I don't know what else really they could do with it. And then the Rocky Mountain, uh, what is it in Denver, the uh, arsenal, then they had that same problem and now it's a wildlife life preserve, so I don't know. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how that works. It's a big plot of land to leave barren. Um, okay, I guess finally we're going to do some just discussion about how you feel about things. Um, you say that you, you're fine about working in the plant, that you never felt really unsafe, and, uh, and, and I'm just wondering have your views about that changed over time? Have they remained the same? I personally never felt that that I wasn't safe. I don't know. I I wondered sometimes about these people working in uh, some of the contaminated areas, and hopefully uh, this won't come back and bite us years later. You know, when a whole raft of people. Uh, die from, well, even the decontamination, because that's been a very, very dangerous thing. But I do remember one time um, being told that there was a, an area out there uh, where they had buried, well, they couldn't get rid of the contamination, so they just put concrete and stuff over it. And this friend that was working at the construction a company with me, we used to take our lunches and go sit on that pad. We didn't know at the time, you know, about this. And we used to go sit over there and not really sunbathe, but we'd pull up our skirts and work on our, we're tanning our legs while we'd have lunch. And I think, oh my gosh, we were. <laughs> but these are the things you didn't know. And I guess what you don't know won't hurt you, hopefully. But I, I personally have no health problems and, uh, you know, ha can't, uh, feel that I was damaged and I was in in a lot of the buildings and I was there was one building I didn't like just because it, uh, they had the records and I think accounting at one time was in the basement of building um, 881 and you had to go down a lot of stairs you know to get to where you're going and I didn't like the fact that it was underground but uh, again do you have any sense of why it was underground I don't know. I don't think it was ever a production plant, but I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know why it was built underground. That's. Okay. And there were others that had tunnels going from one place to another, and of course I've always found tunnels spooky, but you know, it just, uh, and 991 was where they stored the parts, and I worked down there for a while, and again had no idea that was even a dangerous building. Did you but, have to wear protective clothing? I didn't there, I don't believe. But, uh, of course, certain areas were blocked off, too. But I just had to wear protective clothing in, uh, the, in 771, 779, and uh, 441. I worked in <coughs> 441, <coughs> and I had to wear 
I'm going to ask when I went through the machining area. I worked so, in an office, and then if I went through there, I had to wear a, a respirator. What did they make in 441? They, they did the machining on parts, so I don't really know. And actually, in 771, they worked in the glove boxes, which I know were dangerous, and I was in a room right beyond that. And if I went back to talk to one of the men, I would put on a, a mask. But you but, didn't have to put on a coat? Or yes, a coat. I did wear a lab coat. I did wear a lab coat, but I don't know what really, uh, I didn't wear gloves or anything, you know, okay. but that was required, so who knows? Um, what do you think the best things about working for Rocky Flats were? Uh, probably the people, and working there that long, even with a gap, I knew a lot of people. And I also think the safety was good. The salaries were very good. What I personally think was an advantage was that if you got really sick of a job, you applied for another one in, in the same uh, uh, place. So you didn't have to go through the whole thing of quitting your job, losing your benefits. You stayed till you got the job. Sometimes you had to apply a hundred times. But uh, I thought that was a tremendous advantage. And now, you know, people only stay in a job for two years and they quit and go someplace else. Well, for me, this was absolutely heaven on earth. And oh, I'm just going to let that ring. But it just, um, it's one of those things that um, I, I just can't say enough good things. It was a good experience for me. And I'll probably, uh, well, I know I'll never have another job that is that, that good. So. I'll just have to uh, stay with the <laughs> good memories. Um, how about most difficult things about working at Rocky Flats? Well, you know, the weather, driving uh, back and forth to the uh, uh, plant in bad weather was awful. And they used to stagger um, the quitting times on really bad days. They would have some people leave at 3, some at 320 and it uh, but and let's see what would be the worst things I, I just really can't think I've had a couple of rotten jobs out there but you know that can happen anywhere and that was my own doing and some pretty bad managers but uh, other than that I I don't think there were any downsides in my personal opinion so well okay um there's anything else on your notes. Well, I'll tell you a couple funny little things that happened out there. Uh, I was the first uh, person to have an electric typewriter. <laughs> and that had before, well, it was when I was there the first time. Um, so it would have been between 55 and 60. So I don't know when electric typewriters came out, actually. But uh, they for whatever reason, they gave, because probably I was the personnel director, secretary, but I had the first electric typewriter. Isn't that interesting? That's funny. And also when I was hired, the uh, woman's personnel manager said not to uh, mention our salary to anyone, so I didn't tell my husband, which I think is going a little bit, I was very naive. <laughs> of course, when the first paycheck came, he found out, but she said, don't tell anyone. So. Well, so, um, that brings up another question. Could you talk about your job to your family? N well, n I could talk about mine because obviously, but they say don't, you know, don't talk. But I didn't know enough to talk to anyone. Now, they did have, uh, when I was working in the areas where we were actually working with production and things like that, we did a uh, weekly, what would it be, a report that went to our manager, but before we turned in the report, we had to go through the classification department to make sure we weren't using any words. That, and if we were, they took a, a knife and cut the word out. And it was interesting to see these reports with holes in them, but like you couldn't mention beryllium, I don't think, and uh, plutonium and things like that. But it was really, um, I never, well, I've always been very 
um, conscious that you weren't supposed to talk about anything. And I work at the police department now uh, part time. I'm a volunteer. Okay. But they uh, said, now you know nothing can go out of here. And I said, well, you know, I worked at Rocky Flats. <laughs> but you have to be, I always was very cautious, you know, about saying things. And also, I, um, you know, I, I don't know what they do to people that do, I, I'm sure they lose their jobs. But it just never occurred to me to mention specifics. And then, of course, lately they've come out, they had the, papers that they put out every couple of weeks and and eventually things come out that I guess are okay to talk about now. So I just you know, I just they didn't know what I was doing out there, but what I was doing wasn't that special. <laughs> well is there are any final words you want to say about your experiences working at, at the as they say, the most dangerous place, place in, in the, the world? Country? I actually have nothing but positive things to say about it. I truly, truly enjoyed uh, mo most of it, but it was certainly a good place to work. And I never once thought of quitting and finding a job somewhere else. It just never occurred to me. But maybe that's because I've been there so long. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate all of your insights and 